Let's go to our sermon time. Uh, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to go back about six years, but let's start 2 Corinthians 2, and I'm going to start reading at verse 5. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive, I for, excuse me, for, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now the one Paul is uh, referring to in verses 5, 6, and 7 along in there is a man back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, who he said was, had his father's wife, or either mother or stepmother, he says the kind of thing that Gentiles don't even do or talk about. And he said, you should have mourned and should have uh, asked this guy to get out of the church. And he told him back in 1 Corinthians 5 to deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't get much worse than some guy fooling around, shacking up with his mother or stepmother, say stepmother. By the way, that's got to be one of the very best texts for eternal security in the whole Bible. That a guy could fool around with his stepmother and still keep his salvation. Paul said that, this, that, the, um, flesh, that for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I don't know what it is with, with the Pentecostal brethren um, who think... That if you and I profess eternal security, that when we're saved, we're saved for sure, for certain, for forever. That somehow that's giving an opportunity to the flesh to do what it wants to do. Because, oh, as long as I'm still saved. I had a Pentecostal preacher I used to work with. And uh, I was the only believer he knew in the whole company. And so we'd go to lunch together. And... Uh, we got to talking about eternal security. And I said, Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of salvation. And he seemed to say, well, you Baptists, you think that uh, once saved, always saved. So you're saved. You can go out and do whatever you want to do as long as you are you got saved. And I said, listen, I'm a, yeah, I'm a Baptist. And I grew up as a preacher's son. And I've heard my dad preach hundreds and hundreds of sermons over my lifetime. And I've heard dozens and dozens of other preachers over my lifetime, not just visiting our church, but visiting uh, other churches, my family members, grandparents, churches. I, and I said, I've never once heard a single preacher preach something as ridiculous as that. And you can just be saved and do whatever you want to do. So it's okay. That's one of the most idiotic things I've ever heard. I defy you to name one preacher who would preach that way. You know what that is? That's a clever switch or shift or a dodge by some Pentecostal preacher to cover up the fact that he doesn't know the Bible. He wouldn't know uh, how to defend or deny eternal security if his uh, life depended on it. This is why... Rightly dividing the word of truth is so vital. It's so important. Because they're all out there wrongly dividing the word of truth. They figure it's all the same. Pretty much the same. 
What about the parts that contradict? Well, they're all the same. Ah, shut up. You really get worn out hearing people say things like that because they're ignorant of the Bible. But in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And uh, Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 11, that you're supposed to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wily or wild means clever and sneaky. That's why the roadrunner's enemy is called Wile E. Coyote, because he's clever and sneaky. And uh, Paul tells the Christian not to be ignorant about one thing or another thing. And so... I want to talk about the uh, handful of, of things by which Satan can ruin and destroy the life and the testimony and the faith and the confidence and the, the biblical hope that a believer ought to have. I call this the devices of the devil. The devices of the devil. Let me say, there is... A devil. There is a real spiritual person, a real spiritual entity, uh, the focus, the, the embodiment of all evil that fights against the wills of God in the universe, and we know him as the devil, Satan. Uh, he has numerous titles in the scriptures, and we went through some of these, I think, last week in our sermon, but uh, some of his names are Abaddon meaning the destroyer, the accuser. He's called your adversary. He's an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11. He's called Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, or also lord of the demons. Belial, 2 Corinthians 6.15. He's called the deceiver, the dragon, Revelation 12. The enemy, Matthew 13. The evil one, John 17, the father of lies, John 8, 44, Lucifer, which means light bearer. So what he offers you appears bright and shiny and appealing, but it may totally be deception. He's called a roaring lion, 1 Peter 2, 5. He's called the tempter. Uh, the Spanish word is El Diablo, right? So something that is, is uh, devilish and deceptive, we say is diabolical. And what's the Korean word? Magui, um, uh, for devil. The Philistines called him Dagon, Judges 16. The Canaanites called him Molech, 1 Kings 11. The Norse Viking mythologies called the embodiment of evil, Loki. And the Romanian son of the devil was named Dracula. In the book of Jude, we read that Michael the archangel, when contending with uh, Satan about what to do with the body of Moses, said, The Lord rebuke thee. The Lord rebuke thee. Now, these nutty TV preachers and now internet preachers, the Jesse Duplantis's and his teeth, and the uh, Kenneth Copelands and all of these people that that they've learned from or are learning from them, they always want to take charge of the devil. They preach into the camera, Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name, and I take authority over you, and release your hands off of God's people's pocketbooks and so forth and all. Always has to do with finances in the end. Uh, but you ever notice, and I, I picked up on this years ago. I was watching one of these goons on TBN. And he starts, you know, Brother Copeland, would you pray for us and pray for those people watching by television? So he starts praying, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come against you. Heavenly Father, God, do this, that, and the other. And then midway through the prayer, he says, And Satan, I come against you, and I bind you. And I thought, isn't that something? He's praying to Satan. 
And then he ends up in Jesus' name, amen. It's not Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Got to draw it out a little bit. There's these doofuses praying to Satan in Jesus' name, amen. And old Jan Crouch is over there with her living Bible just giving a blessing. You know. I'm glad those two people are dead. I really am. They can't do too much damage. Their son, Matthew, and his ditzy wife, she's trying to be just like her mother-in-law was, you know, no brain in her head. Um, and he's trying to be Mr. Christian Television Producer. Uh, here's what you and I need to pray. We have freedom of speech. I can say this. We need to pray. Now, no physical actions should be taken, but we need to pray that God will destroy Trinity Broadcasting Network. He'll bring it to the ground. He'll cause it to go into bankruptcy and complete ruin, that they'd be having to sell their television equipment, 10 cents on the dollar, that they'd go completely out of business. And that not any of these clowns that have been making a living off God's people on television, now internet, would uh, never be heard from again. Really. I've been praying that God would wipe them out for years, and for some reason he hasn't done it yet. But if I get all of you to pray with me, and maybe, maybe the strength in numbers, right? Strength in numbers. But let me keep moving on here. They don't know who they're fooling with. Uh, charging in to try to take on the devil. There's an old expression that says, fools rush in where wise men fear to tread. Only a fool rushes in and, Satan, I take authority. I uh, Shut up. Can't stand that stuff. But I want to talk to you about some of the devices of the devil. And the first one, if you want to write these down, you can... I won't have you to turn to all of them, but if you're quick on the draw, you can. The first one is here in, in Mark 4, verses 3 and 4. Mark 4, verses 3 and 4. You have an enemy, and his name is Satan, and if he can, he wants to destroy your walk with Christ, your testimony with Jesus Christ, your demeanor with other believers, your friendship with the brethren, he wants to destroy your reputation around town. He wants to destroy your, your uh, confidence and your hope and your faith from day to day in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to ruin it all. And there are a few things he can use to wedge his way in and uh, cause trouble. And that's what I'm trying to focus on the day. But um, in Mark chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. The interpretation down in verse 15. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. The first device of the devil is to steal the word of God away before it can take root and be effective in the life of a saint who needs it or an unsaved person who needs to hear it. Before it takes chance to, has a chance to take root and to bring forth some fruit. It's the devil's job to convince you that you're all right. That you don't need the Bible. You don't need the scriptures. You don't need to read a gospel track. You don't need to hear some preacher, even on television. You don't need to hear some preacher on the radio or on the internet. You don't need to listen to the Word of God. You don't need to hear the Bible preached at all. You're okay. The other guy, he needs help, but you're okay. It's the devil's job to convince you that you're not that bad. What is the song, one of the songs we sing, out of uh, my shame and arrogant pride, Jesus I come, Jesus I come. People have a lot of pride. They have a lot of arrogance. They, they're they fool themselves, that they're not that bad. They really don't need help. And they've convinced themselves that they need help by any guilty feelings they have or come up. They just assuage them and pass them away with booze and drugs and sports and diversions and television 
and Netflix and the internet and YouTube and a uh, hundred of other things, as far as they're concerned, these things are simple diversions and uh, they don't realize these are diversions to get their mind off the real problem and that is that they're lost. They're lost. They don't want to deal with that fact. But uh, put it off till tomorrow. You know, you're picking up a track, you read it, and someone says, hey, come on, we got to go. We got to get somewhere. Put that down. Read it tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. And uh, you, set, you set a gospel track on the, on the break table at work. Well, the next morning, the janitors will have picked it up and thrown it away anyway. You'll never see it again. So when people are offered a track, you and I offer one to someone on the street, they don't throw it down because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. They don't want it. They think they don't need it. There's nothing in there that interests them or could possibly benefit them. Also notice in this passage, there's a saved person, well, much saved as you could get before the crucifixion, verses 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. We say, this book will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from this book. The devil wants to put distance, physical distance between you and your Bible. You run out of the house on your way to church, you forgot to take your Bible with you. First of all, I've been saved 53 years, nearly. And for the life of me, I can't figure out any Christian who would go to church and forget to take his Bible with him. Why in the world would that ever happen? You must not love it that much. It must not be an, an essential part of you. The Bible is your life. The Bible is your life blood. It's the, where you get everything you need from God through a book. You know, when you pray, it's your chance to talk to God. But when you read his book, it's his primary way of talking to you. And if you have no, you don't have enough sense to take your Bible with you. Um, and uh, I've got a little pocket New Testament in back in my office I take to work with me every day. And uh, you should have access to the Word of God as easily as you possibly can all the time. You never know when you're going to need it. But this book will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from this book. If you let your desires and your attentions be controlled by the world around you, then the Spirit of God doesn't have the freedom and the liberty to move in you the way He wants to, to control your thoughts and your actions, and your words, and your gestures, and everything about you, so that people say, that man, that woman, they love Jesus Christ. They, they know God in a real way. Uh, about two years ago, I was working a funeral through my job, and was at a Catholic church. And um, we were concluded with the service, and everybody had left. And I went back in, you know, you go in, you make nice, nice, thank the musician and thank the, the custodian for unlocking the place. And I went and I said, you know, thanks to the, the priest for doing what he did. And he, he, he surprised me, he asked me out of the blue, so how are you doing? And I told him that I'd, I was under uh, chemotherapy. Uh, he was surprised to know that. He asked me, have you ever had uh, someone anoint you with oil? And not your kind, my friend, but... Uh, <laughs> but he said, so before I could talk, uh, really converse with him, he said, well, come with me. 
We went back into the church. It was empty by this time. He still got his robes on. And he said, sit down there. He went over to the shelf there, and I'm thinking, Lord, all right, what's going on here? What's going to happen here? Um, and he gets this bottle of anointing oil they use. I guess it's for you know, extreme unction, last rites. You know, I said, I didn't know I was that close to death yet. But so I just sat there and figured, right, Lord, now I'm just going to let this play out and see what happens. He a little prayer, touch my forehead with this oil. and I did have a chance to tell him how I had been saved when I was a six-year-old boy. I knew I was lost. I didn't want to go to hell for my sins. And if God had a right to judge anyone, he had a right to judge me. I did have a chance to squeeze in that much. So he did his thing. And then he, he comes and sits down next to me. He says, now you pray for me. Really? I wasn't expecting that. I told Brother Turner in Pensacola about this. He said, I'm going to use that as an illustration in uh, class. But uh, so I stood up. He was sitting down. I put my hands on his shoulders. And I, of course, I'm trying to think, Lord, what do I say? And I prayed, God, that you would lead this man. He's in charge of his congregation. He's got decisions to make, uh, money expenditures, and so forth. And I prayed that you'd reveal yourself to him in a real way like you never have before. Of course, I was thinking salvation. And uh, afterwards, uh, you know, shook hands and things and went back to my job at the funeral home. About 45 minutes later, he's calling, wondering if I'm free to go to lunch that day. I, I was unable to make it, but he's been very friendly to me every, ever since that event. And um, I don't know, but God may still open a door for me to witness to him more fully and to talk to him about his own salvation. You never know what's going to happen. You want to be prepared. You want to be ready to serve Jesus Christ. You want to be ready to do something for the honor of God if he opens a door. And not be ashamed or not be afraid to walk through that door. But the devil's desire is to steal the word of God before it can take root in someone's heart. Secondly, uh, the second device of the devil, I want to call your attention to is simply a lack of faith in God. A lack of faith in God. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32 say, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The device of the devil is to get you to doubt God's ability in light of your circumstances. You see problems greater than any you could have imagined, and you wonder, there's no way God can fix this problem, is there? How can God possibly make, a, make something good out of this mess? But um, sometimes it seems like there's no way God could fix the mess that I've gotten myself into. And usually that's where the mess begins. My father, years ago, would do a lot of marriage counseling, and he'd uh, deal with people who had all kinds of personal problems, drug, uh, drug use problems, alcohol problems, domestic fighting with their wives, their husbands, and so forth. And he'd say to me, it's amazing how people can spend 30 years accumulating problems and then hope the minister can fix them in about three minutes. It don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And, um, but the Bible says, But my God shall supply all your need 
according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Don't ever underestimate the ability of God or the power of Jesus Christ to save your hide out of the situation you're in, to deliver you from the trouble to something pleasant that uh, you never thought possible. But God can do it. God can do it. Um, God's the one who loved you enough to send Christ to die for you. God's the one who loves you enough, who wants to sustain you and care for you and to answer your requests and to meet your needs, satisfy the emptiness you have, uh, do things for you that you never thought possible, send blessings to you that you weren't expecting, hadn't anticipated, and yet turns out to be better than anything you could have anticipated. God's uh, a loving God, and God's a, and a powerful God, and there's not a thing that God can't do. So why in the world would you and I doubt him? And unless it's Satan saying, telling you, listen, you really made a mess of things. How in the world can you go and ask your Heavenly Father to fix all the mess you've made? Put a guilt trip on you. That happens to a lot of people. But when you have trouble, when you have problems, you don't have any difficulty getting on the phone, telling someone about it. You tell somebody at work about it. You tell someone on, people get on Facebook and waste their lives with their pretend friends and think that, that these people care about me. And uh, why is God always the last resort? When you have a need, when you have uh, some problem, they really need to cry out and need some help. Why does God seem to be the last one you want to talk to? And yet, it's easy to have, it's easy to have some confidence in God as long as you have car insurance and maybe medical insurance, maybe you have a homeowner's insurance or property insurance for other things, and you have other provisions, it's easy to have faith in God when those things are in place. And there's not a whole lot of risk, uh, not a whole lot that's on the line, not a lot that you're jeopardizing or risking. Um, as long as you have those things, what if those things were gone? What if those things were suddenly gone? Would you still have confidence in God? Thirdly, I want to say the device of the devil to ruin you as a Christian is getting you to doubt the Bible. Doubt the Bible. We get emotional when we talk about our salvation, and we should. We get emotional when we think of how rotten and wicked we were as sinners, and yet God's mercy and compassion saved us. God did think for things for you um, that you don't even realize yet. You won't realize all that was done for you by Christ until you get to eternity, until you get to heaven. I don't have any idea all that was done for me at, at Calvary. Why would a Pentecostal come along and say, well, you can lose it if you're not careful? Well, shut up. Two words come to mind when I think of the charismatics. Shut up. Why would someone want to undermine the work of Jesus Christ? Undermine the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Why would someone come along and say, You can't know? One is written on the plain page of the Bible. The other is you spouting off an opinion from your denomination. If God's willing to save you for eternity, what, what do you make of a preacher who would try to strip that away from you, tell you maybe you're not fully saved or kept saved for eternity? What would you make of someone who talked that way to you? Would you think they're a man of God? 
<laughs> I don't think so. They're doing the work of the devil. But the devil's job to get you to doubt what you read in the Bible, the Word of God. We don't call it the Word of God for nothing. We believe it from cover to cover. And um, the Bible says, Christ said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14. That's what the Bible says. And there's a lot writing on that verse being true. You and I are basing a lot on that verse being absolutely true. And if it's not true, then we have a lot at stake. We're in a big heap of trouble. But the um, Bible says, um, did God, or rather, did God really say that he created the world in six days, rested on the seventh. Uh, the evolutionists uh, certainly deny that, and more and more professing Christians, I say professing, professing Christians want to deny that. They don't want to take the Bible literally. In um, uh, Robert E. Lee, the famous Confederate general, the one whose statues and images they want to take down was a God-believing man nevertheless. And he said, In all my distresses and in all my perplexities, the Bible has never failed to give me light and comfort. You won't hear Joe Biden say anything like that. You'd never hear Barack Obama say anything like that. And I don't know, but I don't know if I'd ever expect to hear President Trump say something like that. I wish we had statesmen like that today. But to believe what you read in the Word of God as being true, I've said this before, it's not my job to correct the Bible or to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me, right? And I don't believe in changing a word. I don't believe in changing the spelling. I don't believe in changing the punctuation. I don't believe in changing a period mark. Leave it as it is. If it's the word of God from cover to cover, then everything on its pages, I should be able to depend upon and not have to question or second guess, but take it as it is. Let the Holy Spirit who wrote the book be the one to teach it to me. It's, the, it's God's job to teach me his book. It's not my job to second guess or to doubt it or question it. And But the, the devil's job is to get you to doubt what you read in the Bible. In Romans chapter 8, I'm not going to have you to turn. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. There's a great promise found. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. In all, all things work together for good to them. So there are certain th things you can't learn. That's a promise you cannot learn and you cannot apply to yourself unless you go through something. All the modern Bibles have eliminated the promise from that verse. They all say, we know that in everything, God is working for our good. And they destroy the promise found in the verse. Everyone thinks God's going to do them good, or they wouldn't believe in God to start with. But the thing that I'm going through, is it working for my good? And the book says it is. But I can't know that unless I go through something and see God lead me safely through or to the other side. It's the only way you can know it. That's, that verse alone and that simple interpretation alone uh, is all you need to show the superiority of this book and the inferiority of all the others. Because there are certain promises you can't know, you can't understand unless you have to go through something. But who wants to go through things?
Let me move on here. The revelation God gives of himself in a book, it's the idea that there could be, first of all, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around the idea of a man who lived in the world, who never committed a sin in thought, word, or deed. He never uttered an unkind or an unintended remark to someone. Everything he said had a purpose and an intention as he said them, and uh, who, who never had to apologize for a word he spoke. Um, he said to his accusers in John 8, which of you convinceth me of sin? Not a one of them could. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around the, the fact that a man could live 33 and a half years in the world and never sin in any form, in any way. It's, it's almost impossible for us to fully grasp a hold of that. But beyond that, the idea that there could be a physical, tangible book on the earth that has no errors in it at all. And you're going to have to give an account of your knowledge of it someday. It's hard for us to understand that or to entertain that concept. And yet, that's the Word of God. We don't call it the Word of God just flippantly. It's the Word and the words of God in the book. But um, point number four, let me move on here. The fourth device of the devil today is to hinder fellowship between brethren, fellowship among believers. The devil delights in seeing uh, believers bitter at one another, and uh, he works to prevent you from having good fellowship with the other saints. Uh, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity, Psalm 133, 1. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 17 and 18, Paul wrote, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. Instead of looking forward each week to church, some people say that's their church, and that's where they want to be identified, but I'd rather not talk to this person. I'd rather not sit near that person. I'd rather not have to converse with this person over there for some crazy reason. And the bigger the church is, the more exit doors there are to, ex to, to get out of, and then you can try to avoid somebody. That shouldn't be. And I'm, I'm very happy to say that it's generally not the rule in Bible-believing congregations. People who say, I have a book that sustains me, and I have a Savior that saved me, and I have the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses me, and uh, I have fellowship with the brethren, and hopefully they have fellowship with me, and uh, we can enjoy each other's company more and more week by week. Uh, hopefully, that kind of friction doesn't rise up in Bible-believing congregations. But human nature being the way it is, it, it certainly does sometimes. But if Satan can get you to say, well, I've got no need to go to church. I've got no need to be around the brethren. Um, we're just going to go to the mountains and go outdoors a lot and worship God from that angle. Um, you're missing out on a whole lot because God didn't establish um, nature walks. He established a local church. And uh, you're supposed to be with the brethren. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10.25 But if he can get you to say, I'm not interested in the brethren, I'm not interested in so-and-so, or brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so, 
and uh, let's just go and maybe as soon as it's over, we can get out of our get out and go home. Then he's gained a great victory. But Paul says in this text that we read earlier, forgiving another is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And being unforgiving, that guy with his stepmom, being willing to, to not, rather not being willing to forgive, he says that's a device of Satan. So either all the Christians should have been on this, needed to be on the same page, which they were, 1 Corinthians 5, to shun that one and say, don't come back unless you're willing to repent, get right with God. Even knowing that it might lead to the destruction of the guy's life, at least the spirit would be saved. But as it turns out, the guy evidently repented and uh, uh, left his sin and wanted to be restored back. And Paul says, you should restore him, welcome, back. welcome him back again. But point number five today, the last device of the devil I want to call your attention to is pain and suffering, physical pain uh, and physical suffering. According to Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12, the devil has power to inflict sickness and misery on people, and he seems to de delight in doing it uh, if God gives him license and, and uh, liberty to do it. Why do righteous people seem to suffer. You know, the old uh, question asked by a, an unsaved rabbi, why do good things happen to bad, or good, bad things happen to good people? Um, that misses the mark. Uh, the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So ultimately, no man is good. But in the general sense, we can identify people who aren't trying to hurt anyone. We consider that oh, he's a pretty decent guy. But in the big picture, no one is ultimately good. But I think you and I understand the, the meaning of a question like that. Why do these tragedies happen to someone who is minding their own business? They, they didn't seem to be out trying to harm someone or hurt someone else. Why do these things have to happen? My dad took me to visit a couple, older couple, Chuck and Betty Oler. And this has been over 20 years ago now. They're both in heaven now. But um, I think he wanted me to meet them and to see them and to witness their life so I'd learn something along the way. And Betty Oler was paralyzed from the neck down. She was reclined in a, in a hospital bed in the house. And uh, yeah, they had a TV set up on the wall so she could have little, you know, distraction. And uh, when her husband took her to the doctor, he had to get this, this harness contraption, get her onto it, and lift her and slide her, swing her over onto a special wheelchair to take her, you know, one of those special buses, take her to her doctor's appointments. And I thought, what a lot of work. And he was in a wheelchair himself, rolling around the apartment, waiting on his wife day after day. And they never visited our church. They were unable to get out of their house. But my dad wanted me to meet these people and see the joy of Jesus Christ on the faces of two older people. They'd get whatever they could glean from, you know, Christian television sometimes. But they'd read the Bible together and they'd pray together and they seemed to have a real joy and a smile on their faces for the Lord Jesus Christ like I had never seen before. And I was... Like I said, I'm about 20 years younger than I am now. And it was a great lesson for me. It was a great thing for me to see. And um, the idea that 
we don't enjoy the fellowship. Thank God we can have fellowship. Thank God we have a place to come and brethren to be with, brethren to talk to and converse with and pray for and they, pr and they for us. You have no idea this side of eternity how important your prayers uh, for that sick person, that person in need will be till you get to the judgment seat of Christ. Six years ago, when I first preached this, I had a full head of hair. Six years ago, when I last preached this, I had no esophageal cancer problems. I had no brain tumor problems. Six years ago, I had two kidneys in my body. I hadn't had a tumor on a kidney yet. But if I had just said, you know, I can't handle this. I can't take this. And yet God gave me enough physical strength to sustain me through the treatments and to keep working as much as I could. Um, I know several people who I was able to lead to the Lord during the last six years. And uh, maybe it was the physical uh, condition I was in that at least gave them a willingness to listen to me, to talk to me. If, if Satan can, he will destroy you. He will wipe you out. He will take your life if he can. According to 1 Corinthians 5, 5, he has the power of death. And um, if he can ruin your life, if he can ruin your health, if he can destroy everything about you so you're unable to serve Jesus Christ, then he will have won a great victory. But thank God uh, who give us, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I have no other friend like the Lord Jesus. I have no one else who ever loved me or cared for me like Christ did, Christ did uh, or cares for me as God does right now. And uh, I'm blessed by every single one of you here each week. And uh, I thank God for the fellowship we have, the friendship we have, and the good conversations we have after services are over, or the things we can pray about and talk to one another about. I'm going to bring this to a close today. We're going to move on with our uh, services today, but I want to say the devices of the devil may not be very many. They may not be that complex or complicated. Maybe any one of these things could take on a different um, shape, different form, and bother you in some way. But there's a story, and I'll end with this, of a little girl uh, who said in her Sunday school class, whenever the devil knocks on my door, I send Jesus to answer it. That's what you got to do. Send the Lord Jesus Christ to answer every call, every knock, and uh, put it all in his hands.